Thank you very much, and good morning to you all. Good morning to you all. I'd like to hear your voices. So I'd like to welcome you formally to this session and to say a very big thank you to the steering committee and all organizers for choosing me to moderate this session, also for making this wonderful selection of early to mid-career scientists to be part of this panel. As already mentioned, we'll be having a conversation around what should be done so that research practices and science are better aligned with the SDGs. Please permit me to give a bit of bio about our panel members. Although names have already been mentioned, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. Franco Cabrerizo, who is a researcher and member of the National Scientific and Technical Research Council of Argentina and an associate professor of, of the National University of San Martin. He is a member of TUAS, La Crepe, an executive council member of TUAS Young Affiliates of UNESCO. Another round of applause for Franco. <laughs> I'd also like to say a bit more about Carlo Di Politi, who is a professor of political economy at uh, Sapienza University of Rome and editor of open access economics journals, including PSL Quarterly Review and Monita Ecredito. He holds a joint PhD in economics and also from Goethe Institute and the Frankfurt AM Main and Sapienza, and a recipient of the 2018 Fortunelli Giovanni Prize for Social and Political Sciences, awarded by the Academia dei Licei, and the 2011 Mirad Prize awarded by the European Association for Evolutionary Political Economy. A round of applause, please. <laughs> Next is Dr. Devina Lubine. She's an assistant professor at the JSS Academy of Higher Education and Research in Mauritius. Her research focuses on ethnopharmacology and non-communicable diseases. Devina is passionate STEM advocate and her dedication to this course is exemplified through her roles as ambassador of the Southern Africa Network for Biosciences, ambassador of the Next Einstein Forum, a fellow of the African, Africa Science Leadership Program, a member of the Global Young Academy, among others. Her involvement in science policy-related programs further underscores her commitment to advancing STEM advocacy agendas. A round of applause for Divina. Last but not the least is Professor Wei Zhang from the Institute of Plasma Physics and also of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. He's a research scientist, doctoral supervisor, and ITER scientist fellow. His main research area is radio frequency heating in magnetic confined nuclear fusion. He has a PhD from Ghent University in Belgium and did her postdoctoral research fellowship with the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics. He has published extensively and has won a number of awards, including the European Physical Society PhD Award in 2018 and the Eurofusion Research Grant in 2019. Way. A lot has been said about the SDGs, and so, I mean, that is why we are here. That forms the very crux of our gathering here today. And so we're going to look at how best we can align research to better the loss of the SDGs, also that the world can benefit from the loss of the SDGs. And the SDGs are supposed to guide us to achieve scientific excellence. So by way of opening remarks, I would like our panelists to share with me their thoughts on the understanding of scientific excellence and how they are trying to achieve this in their various uh, endeavors in terms of their own personal practice, in terms of their mentorship of younger ones under them, in terms of the various positions they hold in the various scientific organizations and institutions that they represent. I'll start with Franco. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, the, in, in recent years, the scientific community and society have uh, made concerted effort to provide a sort of holistic definition for scientific excellence, but briefly, uh, it, it refers to uh, many different quantitative and qualitative aspects of, um, of science, right? And, and this is more or less 
quite established. And in this regard, the GYA working group has done an amazing, an excellent job. Uh, however, is uh, and in particular from the point of view of developing countries, is the evaluation of the scientific excellence that still uh, represent the challenge. Uh, in some cases, the criteria and, and the global metrics that are widely used to evaluate, I should say mostly uh, excellence in research, for example, are widening the gap uh, between the global north and the south. It was somehow mentioned in the panel before. Um, so uh, to promote uh, sci uh, scientific excellence and, and, and also uh, an equitable growth of more balanced scientific communities, in Tian, in the, in the World Academy of Science network of young affiliates and, and alumni, with members from about 85 developing countries, we, we believe in the importance of considering uh, scientific excellence relative to the surrounding. Uh, um, this means uh, taking into a, despite all the high standards and, and metrics already established, we consider and we endorse the, the, the fact that to, to, consider, to take into account the environmental and the challenges faced by, by peers. Thank you. Davina, your thoughts, please. Thank you, Marion, for the kind introduction. To me, uh, scientific excellence is like an umbrella. It does not only include metrics, but it is how we connect our science to the society how we reach policymakers, how we mentor the next generation uh, scientists. And uh, I have been doing it by um, working with communities in my own work. And uh, by doing so, um, I have been able to reach uh, policymakers. So I feel that uh, this, is wha this was actually something that I have achieved in my career. And, uh, Going forward, um, I have always uh, um, tell my um, student and uh, the younger scientists, we need to think on a broader perspective, not only broader, but also on a short-term and long-term aspect. If we include communities in our work, we are going to make it more sustainable. We are going to make our work more sustainable because we are educating them about the different component of the society, about the science. Thank you. Thank you. Paolo? Well, you asked us a very, very difficult question. <laughs> so uh, I'm not a philosopher of science. I would like to stay extremely general to say that to me, e scientific excellence is applying human reason and knowledge for human flourishing in all ways. Why am I being deliberately very general? Because I think we don't uh, recognize enough the diversity of contributions that can, that can from science and from researchers in general. So for example, you also asked about personal experience. I'm here because I'm a member of the Scientific Excellence Working Group of the Global Young Academy. Uh, personally, I also do um, try to uh, do scientific advice. It's not just a personal uh, relationship, actually. I very much agree with uh, Felix when he said that it's also about trying to organize, uh, joining NGOs or helping them, think tanks and so on. I also try to do outreach, maybe because I'm an economist, but I try to write op-eds and I also have a two minute, two minutes weekly um, TV show, to be honest. Um, and I add it to open access journals. It's important, you know, open access, I, I think. We will <laughs> yesterday people uh, talked enough about that, but one of them is in Italian and I think it's important to also recognize that science doesn't happen only in English. And I'm saying all of this to say that all of this doesn't count at all. The only way in which I am evaluated and I have been when I was hired and then promoted and so on, it's only on the basis of publications. This is extremely reductive and problematic in my view. Thank you. Wei. Uh, yes, um, so actually I'm a 100% scientist. I'm, uh, I spend all my time working uh, in the lab and uh, most of the young scientists. Uh, so uh, in my view, I think a scientific e excellence means uh, meaningful research that can promote uh, society development, human peace, uh, better life of humankind, and so on. Uh, it not only includes uh, scientific excellence, uh, 
by doing research, but also includes excellence in connecting science to the society, uh, in applying science with the SDGs, and uh, uh, also science education. So uh, in my practice, I'm working on nuclear fusion science. Uh, we are, our goal is to achieve uh, endless green energy by nuclear fusion reaction. This is also the goal of all my colleagues in Institute of uh, Plasma Physics, Chinese Academic of Sciences. So uh, to achieve this goal, this is very challenging, but once it is done, then all the human beings can use this green energy in the future. So uh, to achieve this, this, this dream, we are working together with all scientists from all, the, all around the world. And uh, we are working very hard to, to, to make nuclear fusion energy uh, realized and then make it into a commercial use. And by then, all humans can use this green endless energy uh, in place of uh, coal, gas, and oil. So this can contribute significantly to the SDGs in terms of uh, affordable and green energy and also solve the uh, problem of climate, climate uh, issues, climate change issues. Also, uh, not only this, uh, scientific excellence also uh, can, uh, uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, popularization of science can also contribute to the uh, SDGs. For example, uh, in my institute, we have the fusion facilities, including East Tokamak and the craft uh, facilities. And, and by using these facilities, we are making a lot of uh, popularization of science to the, to the visitors. So I'm, 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 I'm myself, I'm, uh, I'm engaged in introducing future energy science to all the audience from visitors from all around the world. And by doing this, we not only attract the interest of the society or the government, the interest into the future energy uh, science, but also uh, we can uh, contribute to the equal quality education for all the people. So this is all I consider science scientific excellence. Thank you. Thank you very much, and then thank you all of you for sharing your personal experiences as far as your research and also public engagement with regards to scientific excellence is concerned. Um, as I said, a lot has been said about the SDGs, and my next question will be, is knowledge on the SDGs widespread among scientists of all disciplines? If it is not, what can be done to educate scientists on the SDGs and how best they can incorporate the SDGs in their research objectives. And for this, I'd like Carlo to address that. Well, I think that it was also briefly mentioned in one of the plenary uh, speeches uh, earlier. Um, many science policy um, initiatives, as well as many researchers themselves, still think of a sort of a linear uh, model in which you have fundamental research, then applied research, then development, and then economic growth, which is really not seen in practice. So the first step to me would be to problematize this a lot more and to uh, help researchers themselves to realize that all of the stages can have positive impact on society in, and contribute to the achievement of some of the development goals. Uh, of this, there is a little bit of recognition sometimes, not often, but only basically uh, limited to the stage of com commercialization. So for example, especially in the European Union, you have a little bit of reward, for example, uh, within the European Social Council, sorry, uh, Research Council and so on, uh, of attempts to take research and bring it to the market. What about all else, all the other ways in which we can contribute to society besides uh, commercialization. This is very important, I think. But let me also bri very, you know, say one word about your question itself. You ask about educating researchers. I think, of course, there is uh, training to be done. Uh, Felix already said you cannot improvise, and I totally agree with that. But it's not only about educating, it's also about rewarding. So the whole procedures and criteria of research assessment and research evaluation must be rethought in terms of contribution to society. All right. I don't know if any other panelists would want to chip in something. I see from your body language. Davina? None? Okay. 
All right, so with that said, I would like to, a lot has been said about collaboration right from yesterday with the uh, Open Science Forum. And uh, all of us, I'm sure, have benefited somehow from collaboration along our journeys that we've done so far with regards to our careers. Uh, but uh, I would like to choose two of the panelists to address the issue of collaboration because of where they are coming from. So starting with uh, Franco, who is working with the uh, TWAS Young Affiliates Network, which is a, a network for young scientists from across the globe and has also other experiences with collaboration. What do you think is the role of collaborative research, both local, uh, national, and uh, international, in achieving the SDGs uh, for young scientists? Franco, would you like to take that? Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned these three uh, interdisciplinary. Um, yeah, interdisciplinary, uh, yes. Yeah, but at local and also international level. Yeah. And, and let me just briefly say something about this. Uh, uh, it's a complex matter, of course, and, and I'm not going to have time to address all the, the, the potential impact, but briefly, uh, and it's key in, in both, in, in achieving and promoting scientific excellence, but also um, uh, achieving the SDGs implementation, I would say. Uh, at the local level, uh, collaboration promotes or, or ensures the, that scientific findings are contextually relevant. Uh, and also promoting s sort of um, sustainable solutions that, that the local community needs. Briefly, at uh, international level, uh, it allowed us to tackle um, global challenges that are extended beyond the geographical network, that, that this is the, the powerful of scientific collaboration. Uh, but most importantly, uh, in particular from the developing countries' point of view, could be that international collaboration also um, allowed us to, to take advantage of the strength of all the countries and, 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 and partners by sharing information, uh, by sharing resources, or having access to technologies and, and sharing technologies. Uh, and interdisciplinary because the, the challenges outlined by SDGs are quite complex and, and require this um, holistic point of view. But let me tell you a little bit more about this by sharing one particular action that um, somehow Tian is, is leading, and allow me to provide a little bit more uh, light into this. So in Tian, we believe in this broad concept of, of scientific excellence uh, that includes not only the, the practice itself of, of high standard research uh, by, I don't know, methodological rigor, innovation, ethical conduct, but also uh, the in the collaborative effort of, of knowledge transfer by training and mentoring next generation of scientists and, and global society. And, and in this context, a few years ago, we launched a, a, a research and, and educational training program. Uh, we call it uh, for, for Sustainable Development. We call it Teach for SD. Um, and the program was conceived to um, to provide or to promote uh, hands-on training courses on specific topics that are, might, might be relevant for early career researchers, PhD, undergraduate students in developing countries. Um, mostly through summer schools and so on. And, and these, um, these training courses are set up by TN members that act as international instructors uh, sharing and passing on their their knowledge experiences that they had themselves gained in, in, in other top research laboratories. Um, but through this south-south multidisciplinary and collaborative uh, initiative uh, or pr training initiative, uh, Tian helps the trainees to gain or to be equipped with the, the, the tools they need to further their own research, this on the one hand. And this can be highlighted with one briefly uh, ins inspiring story that I would like to share with you, where two women um, scientists, I can tell, are breaking barriers in, in, in assessing the environmental impact of mining operation in, for example, in Bolivia. Uh, 
these two ladies, Dr. Moscoso and, and Rodrigo, Dr. Rodrigo, they could attend to one of these uh, summer courses, in particular one related to the, 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 the use of animal models for experimental research. Uh, and during that experience, of course, uh, apart from gaining uh, the, the, the experimental tools, experience on the t experimental tools they need for that, they could foster a network and, and they gain confidence to, to lead efforts on establishing their own uh, ecotoxicology lab. Um, but most importantly, using a particular, I mean, two, two particular animal models that were not being in use in Bolivia at the time, but that the entire international scientific community have already agreed that these are the most uh, uh, accurate and more precise uh, animal models needed to achieve this particular I mean, the impact of, of mining, for example, in human health. So and, and to, to, to finish with this intervention, of course, this, all these complex um, problems or matters require um, a holistic approach and, and with a lot, of, um, a, a lot of work from, let's say, science diplomacy, of course. But uh, going back to the, to, to the main question, it is clear that the impact of um, expanding their local scientific capacities through this collaborative research and, and, uh, and education um, is, is certainly impressive and is, is the way to go. All right, thank you very much for sharing the Tian experience, particularly with regards to solving the menace of uh, uh, small-scale mining, I guess, and environmental impact. I would also like to know the ITER Max Planck, uh, ITER, 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 yes. And the Max Planck experience, and any other you'd like to share? Uh, yes, yes. From um, way. Yes. So, um, so the challenges in SDGs, uh, for example, the uh, affordable and green energy, climate change, uh, poverty, hunger, uh, human peace, all these kind of uh, issues are not easy and cannot be solved by single one single country. So it requires international corporations from different countries to work together and solve these problems. So in science, take my research field, for example, fusion science, uh, we have an excellent example, which is ITER. Uh, the full name is uh, International Thermonuclear Fusion Experimental Reactor. So this is a device now is under construction in, in France. So it, the, uh, this is the largest international cooperation scientific project. It is similar to CERN, but uh, larger than CERN. And uh, uh, it involves uh, more than 30 countries and uh, more than 120 institutes from all around the world. And uh, although it has some construction delay, but now uh, during, uh, uh, because of its uh, scientific, uh, scientific research, it uh, greatly promotes the fusion research and the uh, applying uh, the, uh, the application of, uh, uh, of technology, technologies in industry in all these particip participating countries. So it really uh, greatly help the science development in each country. And also, uh, not only this, it also in attracts the interest from other countries which are not uh, involved yet. So also including many countries from Asia and uh, Africa. Uh, so my institute, uh, Chinese Academic of Science, is one of the, um, one of the major party which have been playing a very important role in the, in the ITER project. Uh, more importantly, uh, our institute have built the uh, first uh, superconducting tokamak, which is called uh, EAST, and uh, we allow uh, scientists from all around the world to participate in the experiments and uh, use the data. So as a result, now we are cooperating with more than 50 countries, uh, including uh, Africa, uh, Europe, America, and Middle East, and uh, we are also cooperating with more than 120 institutes from all around the world. Uh, not only this, we are also helping other countries, for example, especially the developed countries, to develop their uh, fusion research. And, and, and for, for example, we uh, recently we, we did not a superconducting tokamak, which is called TT1, to Thailand within the framework of one belt, one load, to help to initiate to engineer, 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 to start their fusion research uh, 
to start their treatment research. So this is the first uh, superconducting topmark running in the South, uh, Southeast Asian region. And uh, uh, of course, we are also helping Africa countries. So we organize uh, summer school on plasma physics every year uh, in, in, in Africa. And more than, uh, this year more than uh, 70 students from different African countries uh, participate in this uh, summer university. And this, great, of course, greatly help them to develop their uh, science and also science education. So, uh, so this is uh, how we cooperate with the international countries and international institutes. For myself, I get my PhD degree and did my postdoctoral post study in, 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 in Germany and in Belgium. So now I'm also keeping cooperating with uh, many institutes from all around the world. Uh, actually, we, we are recently we are now uh, we, we we built the radio frequency antenna, which is used for heating in nuclear fusion. For the nuclear uh, for the nuclear fusion facilities in uh, Germany and, and, and in, Fra in, the, in France, and we are also trying to you know help help the African countries, for example Tunisia, to build a, uh, a linear plasma machine. So this, this is uh, uh, my experience. All right, thank you for your thoughts on collaboration. This is a follow-up. So the ITER project is a thermonuclear fusion reactor. Yes. How far is that project from the market? Is there a goal to get it on the market to harness the energy for commercial use? How far uh, is yes, the world it from depends. that? Uh, it depends. So uh, the ITER project, we, we expect it will run in 2030, which is seven years from now. By that, by, by that time, we will have the first pl plasma. So ITER is a demonstration that nuclear fusion energy can be used so that the output power is more than the uh, heating power, the injected power. So which, which can demonstrate that fusion energy can use in the market. And then after ITER, then we will have uh, another next generation of uh, fusion device, which is called a demo. Then if, if ITER is uh, successfully running, then uh, Different countries, for example, the European, China, Japan, U.S., or uh, uh, and, and Russia, and all these countries. We then we we are we are trying to build this next generation tomac, which is demo. Demo then can be uh, formally used in uh, commercial use. So, which means it can generate 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 electricity power, which can be used in the market, and then we can use the electricity. So this is uh, like a. 30 to 50 years later. All right, thank you very much for the insights on that. Um, during Carlos' intervention on education on the SDGs, you had indicated that beyond education, those who apply the SDGs and their research objectives should have some benefits. I would like Davina to follow up on that trajectory. How do you think we can offer incentives, benefits for young scientists in particular who align their research goals with the SDGs? How do we get them interested? I think here the, the key factor is money. <laughs> uh, so I think um, the first thing that universities should really do, institutes should really do is about the uh, grant program. There are already many programs that uh, um, is uh, covering the SDGs related project. But here, the key component is a long-term funding because it takes week, years, even uh, years to build trust relation with collaborators, with community. Uh, but if we don't get long-term funding, everything is going you know, useless because we lose everything, all the information, all the effort we have done, we lose everything. And in countries uh, like Mauritius, we are like, a we are from, I'm from a developing country and we still struggle to secure money to, to conduct a um, project to make them sustainable. So this is very crucial that we have long-term funding, but also uh, incorporate the aspect of interdisciplinary approach and uh, I believe that the project that are related to SDGs we should actually uh, it's it's require a multi uh, interdisciplinary approach we can't the work in silos we can't really do everything ourselves 
So if this component can be bring up and the university, the institute can uh, uh, you know, promote this and support it, this is very uh, important. And another aspect is, uh, I would say, access to data and resources. Um, it's very, very hard to get information from the government regarding uh, any uh, topic. For example, if I want to get information how many people are suffering from Alzheimer in Mauritius, it's just impossible. And uh, sometimes it's like five letters, several emails, and month for of waiting. So this is a situation. So if institute can actually facilitate this part, like you know, uh, really support us to reach uh, uh, the government and to get the information that we want, this will be very very helpful, because. Um, time is money. The more we have to wait, we are losing time, money, effort. So this is very, uh, very uh, important component. And also, um, organization institutes should um, really support open access uh, publication. So if uh, some kind of funding can be provided. So yeah. If um, you have access to information, it will help formulate your research goals in yes. line with the SDGs. Yes. On this note, we'd like to take a short break and hear from the audience. Any comments, any questions to our panel, we very much appreciate it. Yes. Very good morning. Uh, my name is Pavel Kabat. I am currently Secretary General of the International Human Frontier Science Program former Director General of IASA and many other colleagues in the room. I work together on the science support of the SDG agenda. So suppose one of you is a Prime Minister of, say, France, and you have all the science which science provides about the DGs. We have 17, as you know, as they are ranging from energy to water, air quality and climate and all of that. And then that prime minister would like to develop genuinely investment agenda for the next 10 years. What would be the question to the science? What question would you have to the science being prime minister, having genuinely money and intention to implement SDGs? So what would be your question to the science community? Given all the complexities, given all the interconnections, given all the core benefits and potential conflicts, implementing 17 development goals sustainably to the sustainable future. Um, Carlo, would you like to take that? Since you are the only non-scientist, humanities bias person maybe. So, and any other person would want to say something. Yes, but I'll start with you. I would argue that the social scientists too are <laughs> scientists. So, uh, <laughs> well, my reaction would be, uh, the first question, or the one I would ask is, how the kind of research that you're already doing can better contribute, can have an impact, can go outside of the hour, hour tower? I think that here we have, uh, you know, a, a very important trend going on, especially in the European Union, you mentioned France, uh, with this idea of missions and in general of being able to drive the direction of research that partly is totally understandable and partly uh, even positive maybe, but it cannot take 100% of the budget. There has to be also room for bottom-up proposals from the scientists themselves. So the kind of question, in my view, should not necessarily focus just on the missions, but rather ask them, you know, what are you currently doing? How will it help society even beyond commercialization? That's the only thing we currently ask. Thank you very much. Any other intervention from the panel? Okay, thank you. I see a hand here to my left. How do you align mathematics with the SDGs? Uh, uh, would you like to take that way? Yes. Uh, the mathematics is a relatively basic uh, scientific research, but it can also be used. I mean, this for the basic research, 
it can be used in, in application for for in science which are more related to the uh, markets. Uh, for, for example, for, for what, what we are doing is fusion energy. So we, actually our theories including a lot of uh, masses, a lot of uh, complex uh, equations. So by, in, by in, uh, applying mass in our fusion science, we, which is physics, well physics is based on mass, right? So by using mass to solve the problems in physics, and then we can build those simulation models, very complex simulation models based on mass. And then uh, with these uh, complex simulation models, we can calculate or simulate the plasma states. For example, the pla or to calculate all the plasma, monitor all the plasma parameters, and uh, calculating how the plasma evolves during the, during the experiments. And then by doing this, uh, we can then, for example, once we realize fusion, then the fusion can be used in the supermarket. And then this is how we start from the basic uh, science, math, and then go to the market. Of course, there's a, a, a lot of other examples we, where we can use math. For example, radio, f radio frequency wave. wave. Uh, we, we, well, these are based on Maxwell equations. This is math. And then by starting from this math, we can go to apply this math into, you know, uh, a radar, a broadcasting, all these are used in our daily, uh, daily life, but these are all based on math. Do you think Pythagoras or Bertrand Russell, however socially engaged he was, would stick to that view? Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat your question again? I'm not sure that Pythagoras or uh, uh, Bertrand Russell, the great philosopher of math, would stick to that position. What do you think of that? You think he would agree with you? Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> 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 we agree. <laughs> Do you think Pythagoras, if he were here, would agree with your, your submissions? That's the question. Okay. Will he be? Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Let's just have the <laughs> complex issue <laughs> after this discussion. All right. Maybe so you can have that conversation over coffee later. Can we have some more contributions or questions yeah. Yeah. right here? But, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Ma my name is uh, Riyad Bazia. I'm working with uh, the United Nations here in Geneva, oh. in including with uh, WIPO at ITU. What I want to share, sustainability. We are living sustainability and the sustainable development, the economical development, the social development, and the SDGs, they are development goals for 15 years but before SDGs, it will be all also other sustainable development, other development goals, millenniums. So beyond 2013, we have another also agenda because the international negotiations, it's working like that necessarily, mainly on environment and science. And here, uh, what I want to, concisely, yes, the uh, basic sciences and as yesterday, we were talking about open science and science for all. All with two I. Then we should think about IA, artificial intelligence, and for all, including artificial intelligence. Yeah, this is what I hear uh, just uh, right now. Previously, and the classification of science, the philosopher since few uh, centuries ago. Uh, since one century, the University of Science and Technology, the technology itself developed and we got high technologies. And nowadays we are living another generation, highest technology, what is called new technologies. So I am concluding on that point. UNESCO, it is not the unique international organization can deal with that issue. WIPO, Worldwide Intellectual Property Organization and the uh, International Telecommunication Union can do with that. And uh, yes, because UNESCO, mandate is science and culture and education, three mandates. This is what I want to share with you, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are you entertaining any reactions? 
you ended on a note of um, advice, you more or less, but you started with a question whether after the SDGs there will be another global call for sustainability. Are you interested in some reactions to that? Yeah, yeah, let me share with you also. But the international community adopted another development, other goals, which called Archie goals for biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And it used to be catastrophic because uh, nobody was motivated for that because the climate change negotiation, it used to be hard until 2020. But anyway, sustainability in development, in science, in economy, in social. Thank you for that. Thanks in for finance. <laughs> Thanks for the clarification. Yes, please. Uh, now I will ask you the classical question. I give you one million US dollars, each of you. How are you going to use it to achieve these goals? Please. <laughs> one million USD. How are you going to use it to achieve either of the goals, I guess, not all the 17? <laughs> Problem of the day. <laughs> Who wants to start? I'm going to try, but yeah, uh, it's a tricky question. Um, on the one hand, it's not enough money to achieve this. Let, let, let me start with this. But let's suppose that we, y y what you said, we have all the money we will need to address this. We need to do it in a holistic way. I mean, uh, you, uh, some, somebody in the audience also asked about the contribution of math. It's, it's not only a matter of, of the particular topic, how one particular research can solve any, uh, some particular um, challenge B because it's math for example is also help to train the logic thinking and 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 this is also very important that's why with the money with all the money we need to we, we need to invest in every single uh, step of the knowledge creation chains I would say including from from the very beginning from from young uh, kids from kids but also in science research to develop um, the most fundamental uh, basic research and also to apply research, but also training the people, communicate the people. Otherwise, we will have um, uh, people believing in, in, in that, that the, the earth is flat. So, so we need to, to help uh, to build the, the, the real knowledge, uh, the logic way of thinking. Uh, so there is no way, only one way to spend the money uh, one right way to spend the money to achieve all these uh, issues. The money should be invested in every, in every um, step of the knowledge uh, and building, you know? This is, m this is my feeling, so. Alina? I will start with simple question. When, what, how? So I make a list, prioritize, maybe one or two goal maximum and see how I can attract more funding. One million is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right, uh, Carlo? Well, <coughs> I will have, I, I don't know the answers, but I, I would have two comments on the question itself. One is, uh, you asked each of us, and I think that's already one of the issues with the current uh, ways in which many steps of funding of science work, uh, talking from uh, promotion and hiring decisions to the Nobel Prize that was mentioned before. We continue to think of science very often as an individual effort, whereas if you think of the kind of investment and the large number of people that are needed you know, to do the kind of things that Jean does or CERN here, for, I think, at least several decades now, science is no longer an individual effort. And we should rethink the way we even consider the, the questions about what to found and where to found it. Um, and, and second point, very, uh, very quickly. Um, I think also the question actually is very interesting because that's uh, some of the things that some funders have suddenly started to do. For example, uh, the Volkswagen Foundation and others have started, for example, to uh, develop ways of funding research that are not based on the typical grant writing and then rewarding people what stu for stuff that they have done in the past, such as, for example, lotteries or flat rate uh, basic funding uh, f uh, solutions. I think these are extremely interesting, to be honest. We? Uh, only study for nuclear fusion research, uh, one, billion, one million is too less. If you can give <laughs> four million to me, of the money give to me, maybe I can do more. <laughs> well, <laughs> but, but, but yes, uh, the, the thing is, um, 
for example, to take a ether, for example, I think, I think the budget is much more than one million, maybe one billion. Because it, this is a really huge device and uh, involve many countries. And so, the, so, so really for future energy research, uh, you need a lot of money. But, uh, but other than this, I mean, uh, there's other new energy studies. For example, the solar energy, uh, wind energy, this can actually cost uh, much less. So actually, there's a, a you know a, a group actually in our institute. In our institute, they are, they are investing in solar energy. So 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 by, by this, they, they can develop new technologies to make better uh, you know solar uh, solar 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 energy machines, which can uh, directly put in, into the supermarket uh, in, into the market and and and, and commercial use. So for, for this kind of new energy studies, one million is enough. And if you just give me one million, yes, I, then we are invested into the new energy, such as solar energy, uh, powder energy, uh, window, win, win, uh, win, window energy, uh, this hi hydro energy, this, this kind of new energy things, which cost a little bit small. And by, by doing this, we can then uh, 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 contribute to the SDG of, of uh, affordable and clean, clean energy for, for more, more, more people. So this, this is my answer. Thank you. Even though I'm the moderator, permit me to also take a bite of the one million USD. <laughs> I will use it on uh, SDG 12, which is sustainable consumption and production patterns. And I will do that because we're calling for development, but we need to be mindful of how the development affects us. Are we developing so that we're creating more problems? So I'll look at greener approaches to production, responsible exploration, exploitation of our natural resources, so that we don't create one problem as we solve another. I'll look at uh, green approaches to agriculture, climate smart agriculture and production. I'll look at um, uh, the need not to waste food so that there's proper circulation of food around the world because the total amount of food that goes to waste globally can feed the whole world if it's properly moved around. So this is what I'm going to use the one million US dollars for and I hope I get it at the end of the day. On this note, I would like us to take a break from, okay, <laughs> I'll give one last um, opportunity but we'll come back to the audience after this round of um, so Thank you much yeah. indeed. Uh, sorry for intervening and coming back to this question. My name is Chaba Kureshi. Uh, I was the president of the General Assembly and in one of my previous reincarnations, I was co-chairing the negotiations that produced the SDGs. If you have $1 million for implementing the SDGs, I have a good news and the bad news for you. The bad news that you are in a very deep trouble. The good news is that you have much more money than, than $1 million. Uh, actually, when we calculated how this whole transformation could be done economically through investments, the size within 15 years is about 90 to $95 trillion. Uh, so $1 million is a very nice sum, but it's not about the transformation. The second let us not be depressed by the size of this 90 trillion dollars because sustainability transformation is not something that we do business as usual and add some extra money to add some little more of other activities no we are changing the operations we are changing budgets we are changing industries we are changing infrastructure and education. So you don't, uh, our problem today is that we spend money on systems that produced crisis. And then we spend money that tries counterweighting the system that is producing uh, crisis. Let me give a, con a concrete example. We are still subsidizing fossil fuel energy sources at the range of $500 billion per year. Thus, we create climate change. On the other hand, we tried to subsidize 
new energies, clean energies, in the range of $300 billion to cultivate the market advantage of the fossil fuels. So, simply mathematically, we are spending $800 billion for nothing. I know it's much more complicated, uh, but uh, the mathematics uh, of sustainable development transformation uh, is of a much bigger size. Uh, it is aiming transformation, and how to spend one million or one trillion depends very much on the given country and community. When we created SDGs, we created a vision where and how we would like to see this world by, uh, by uh, 2030. They were not created to be implemented in this way in any particular country. We expected any particular country to create their national implementation plans. And the national implementation plans do rely on the actual state of development, traditions, priorities, possibilities of the given country. So if you are asked what to spend the one million, my first instant reaction would be look at the national implementation plan and you will see what are the most transformative projects in that plan. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights on the topic. Thank you so very much. We would like to have another round of um, interventions on my preset questions and hopefully if we still have time we'll come back to the audience. During the conversation I heard Davina talk about open science. So my question to you will be how does open science contribute to the alignment of research objectives with the SDGs? Yes, I think I had I heard you say that mention open science. Yes. Yes. Open, <laughs> so uh, I want to follow access, up on that. Yeah. Yes. So open access um it uh, promote global accessibility. Uh it is very uh crucial especially for people and researchers, researchers and policymakers living in underdeveloped and developing countries because we don't have uh, access to the right information, so we can't really set up projects, we can't really move forward or apply grants. So this is very crucial. It helped to uh, bridge the knowledge gap. And uh, what is also uh, important here, when the information is available and we know what other people are doing, we, uh, we actually take the initiative to contact people and create collaboration and work together, which is very, very essential. And uh, also, open science allowed um, uh, policymakers to, to think about uh, the problem and really take the right decision, take uh, science-based uh, uh, decision, which is uh, um, very important because if we don't have the right framework, we can't implement projects, we can't implement results. So having the right framework, the right policy, it's a key factor. All right, thank you. Um, Franco, would you like to add something to the issue of open science and how um, young scientists can take advantage of that in alignment of their research goals with the SDGs? Uh, sure, yes, um, open access and open science open um, access, yeah. has a key role in, as, as a catalyst for promoting um, SDGs. It was already mentioned yesterday, today, and also mentioned by, by Davina, by fostering collaboration, democratizing science, um, the knowledge, making it more available for the community and for also the decision making ma makers just to have um, their resolutions based on scientific facts. Um, but they have a, role, a key role also in shaping this SDG-aligned research, I mean, the future of this. Um, open science makes, uh, enhances the visibility of the findings, but also of the impact. Uh, the largest is the visibility or the access to the data, the more the um, uh, translation of this achievement into sustainable solutions and and this is circular you know because uh, as the implementation also 
brings up um, new um, challenges that uh, or new questions that might be uh, arised and, and solved by the scientific community. So it's a kind of retroalimentation of the retrofitting, I would say, the, uh, of the research on the future. But um, regarding this, uh, it's not, all, not only open science, um, open access, um, who really has a, a key role in shaping these SDGs um, aligned future research. Um, let me also, um, or let's also consider the, the transformative role that uh, the evaluation systems also have in this. Um, despite uh, what any um, publishing models um, uh, might, might try to uh, push according to their economic financial interest or profits, the academic and the scientific society has a powerful tool uh, creating and using the right um, evaluation system, I mean evaluation of the academies and researchers as uh, a key factor to, uh, for driving this, the, the future of science. Uh, but just only, uh, I would like to bring into this conversation only one, one concern about open access, N not only the benefit, but also one concern that is important to, in my opinion, and, and in particular from the developing countries' point of view, to start thinking about. Maybe it, it might not represent a huge problem today, but it could represent a, a barrier in the future. And it's related to the lack of um, clear regulation regarding the far the use of, of, of the, the data, the, da the data uh, published openly. Um, mm, we, um, I mean, this finding can be in an ideal world, we will, we will publish everything, we will be open. Uh, finding or research in most of the countries are supported by government, public funds, uh, in an attractive way by the community. So, and this knowledge can, can serve as a fundamental for uh, the development of new technologies, new achievement. And, and most of the time, this knowledge returned to our countries uh, in the form of a purchasable product, you know, it's protected by intellectual properties, intellectual right. And in most of the cases, we cannot afford that. I mean, people cannot afford uh, that. So. Again, this is, might not be a problem today, but it's, uh, it can be a barrier in the near future that it's also important to have in mind and think about that. Um. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we are almost out of time. So I'll give the last but not the least slot to Carlo on how policy can be formulated such that there is reward for research that uh, focuses on the SDGs. After well, which you will have your concluding remarks, less than a minute per person, then we wrap yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, well, on the policy, I think uh, I already stressed that I think it's very important to uh, recognize the huge variety of contributions that people do in science. It's not just this romantic idea of a single intellectual, you know, uh, close in a room or in a lab. It's really a team or effort with a lot of money being invested and very different uh, people with different skills that should be rewarded even when it comes to research evaluation, for example. But very quick comment on uh, the, the president's uh, remark before on what appears to be money madness now being spent both in one direction and the other. I think this is a perfect example, of, for example, of how a crucial question here is money being spent by who and advantaging whom, and that's one of the topics on which I dare say that maybe the social sciences can, only con can also contribute. So that's one of the examples in which I would say it's important to have an interdisciplinary uh, debate, including the social sciences. Thank you very much. Would you end with your parting remarks? Then I move to the next. You're okay. All right, uh, Franco, your final remarks. Yes, um, in the framework of this panel, but, but also in, in connection to the, the event that Kaderin is gathering us today, I would like to emphasize two particular things. One of them is, is that despite of what some money-oriented government claims, in particular, for example, I, I can say that the, the, the very recently president elected in my country, in Argentina, the world needs uh, more uh, scientists advocate for basic science. 
um, and in particular in developing countries, again, a basic science is the uh, represent the fundamental for any further development. So we, we need to keep working on that and paying effort on that. And second, second and maybe a little bit more ambitious, um, but uh, I believe that the scientific community uh, should also advocate for creating uh, new regulations uh, at an international level or diplomatic level uh, that make, um, that ensures that um, the, the, the right status or the maximum status or recognition for science within any organizational structures could be as ministerial rank or a similar capacity. Uh, it might sound utopic, but it's time to, to, to give the, the, to science the status that, that science deserve. The world needs more advocates for basic science, I heard you. Divina? The sustainable development goal is, um, is a gift to humanity. There is no doubt about it. And uh, it is across generation because it is inclusive. To my opinion, uh, it is maybe the right time, uh, like seven years in advance, to think what is on the other side of 2030 how we are going to um, uh, transfer the research excellence, the skill that we have developed along the line to the next generation, how we are going to sustain it, and also how we are going to keep the interest of everyone on, as a, on the SDGs. So this the is the SDGs, timely, a gift to humanity. How are we going to sustain it? Yeah. Thank you. Carlo. <laughs> Well, very quickly, because we, we need also to, to leave space. No, I, and to conclude also, uh, coming back also to the mission uh, thing, I think it's very important than the sustainable development goals or what we will come after that since we are already basically running out of time will be much widely shared and also to find forms of, of also making at least some of the effort bottom up. There has to be a lot of participation on the side of scientists, but also on, on the side of society as well. That's, I think, it's quite what is, you know, currently possibly not fully um, there yet. Thank you. And finally, we. Uh, well, so uh, I think uh, this year is the middle year towards the to, uh, achieving the final goal of SDGs. So uh, we. To achieve these SDGs in time, we need to act now. Uh, as, sci as scientific researchers, we need to align our research goals uh, with the S SDGs and uh, do our best to contribute, contribute to the uh, SDGs. Uh, to achieve scientific excellence, we need to uh, work together not only with the colleagues in our community, but also cooperate with the people in other areas, with the people around the world. And uh, for our fusion study, I and my team, we all do our best to develop a new uh, science and technologies to such that to speed up the future energy study. Uh, for example, we are now, uh, we, we, we have built the uh, East Tokamak and now we are be building the best Tokamak. By doing this, we can uh, do our best to re realize the nuclear fusion and then use the, this nuclear fusion energy for all the human beings in the, uh, in the future. So, uh, uh, sorry, just <laughs> well, last a few words. Uh, uh, so, I, so with our wisdom, belief, and the continued efforts, I believe that uh, we can accomplish the SDGs in time. Uh, we can solve the problems of uh, affordable and clean energy, climate change. We can solve the problems of poverty, hunger, uh, human peace. We can do our best to improve our, our human life to have a, 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 a better, uh, we can, of course, together, we, we need to work together to, so that we can make our planet a better place for us to I live. I hear you, okay, Wei. Thank you. You call for collaboration and then you give your personal resolve to make <laughs> sure the world is a better place. A round of applause to all the panelists. This has been Franco, Davina, Carlo Way, and myself, Marian, from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Thank you very much for having us.